the third exodus, Christians that are battling America's Ramses spirit. And you say, what is Ramses? You're about to find out. Let's look at Exodus chapter 1, 7 through 8, as we talk about the third exodus, Christians battling America's Ramses spirit. Exodus 1, 7 and 8, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly great. And the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. That's my key point. There arose a new king in the nation that knew not Joseph. My introduction is this, three different points. History will repeat itself. History has always repeated itself in what I call repetitive cycles. What has been Ecclesiastes chapter one tells you is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done. Repetitive cycles. That's what we're gonna show you in a moment from the Exodus narrative. Number two, prophetic patterns are going to be repeated at the time of the end. In my book, The American Apocalyptic Reset, I focused on the Tower of Babel very heavily because that is Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, same, same name, same name, and how things will repeat themselves from Genesis 11 that's going to occur in this global reset that we see taking place. Now, what God's people will experience in the future can be discovered in the Bible because it's concealed in these stories that we're about to talk about. Now, in, to, in the prophetic times that we're living in today, I believe that our time can be compared to three different time frames. Number one, you know the story from Matthew, the day of Lot, the seasons are the days of Lot. Number two, the days of Noah. And number three, here's a good one for you, the days of Elijah. Now, why am I bringing in Elijah? Because the Bible says in Malachi, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord who will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children of the fathers. And in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, one of those two witnesses is the prophet Elijah who appears the first 42 months of the tribulation. So as we prepare to enter into major prophetic seasons, a time I call the time of the end, the last days, the end of days, the latter days, all terms found in your Bible, then I believe again that we're entering in the days of Lot, the days of Noah, and the days of Elijah. Let's take a look at those days for a moment and just see our patterns repeating themselves. When you go into the days of Noah, what is the main theme about the entire days of Noah? It's water. An abundance of water that's covering the earth that seems to be destroying everything around it. Have you observed the amount of floods that start happening this year? Germany and Austria and all these countries, China, literally cars being picked up and moved down the street, entire cities being destroyed, entire homes being destroyed. And I'm sitting there looking at this and it's all over the internet. It's all over uh, pictures on uh, different channels. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, this looks like the flood of Noah's day. It's hitting seven nations in Europe, bringing billions of dollars of destruction. Now, Noah's flood was about 4,200 years ago, and yet it's repeating itself in the form of massive flooding in the earth. As it was the days of Noah, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Number two, the days of Lot. What was the big event of Lot's day? Fire. A city was consumed with fire. By the way, they think they just found Sodom and Gomorrah. They found glass that had been burnt with fire. They found ash. They found all these things. It just became breaking news. How odd is it as it was in the day of Lot? So will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. And they also have researched and believe they've actually found Noah's Ark. How cool is that? They're finding Noah's Ark, 4,200 years old. They're looking at the days of, uh, I'm sorry, Noah's Ark. They're, they're finding the days of Lot, 3,800 years ago, and finding the places that where these events happen. Why is that significant? Because I think it's a sign to you and I that we're entering into those seasons by archaeology just discovering these places of actually where they took place and where they were. Now, so you had water in Noah's day, you had fire in Lot's day, now you have the days of Elijah. What was the big theme about the days of Elijah? Are you ready? In the days of Elijah, there was a drought going on for 42 months. Hey, stop right there, pay attention. Noah, water, seven countries in Europe completely, totally flooded. Then the days of Lot, fire. Look at 
the west coast of the United States burning, 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 tens of thousands, millions of acres. And then you have drought in the time of Elijah for 42 months. Seven states in the United States are in the most serious drought that they've ever been in in their history. And unless supernatural rain comes, it will affect the food supply of the United States in a level that you and I have never seen that will be equal to what we saw during the time of the Dust Bowl of 1929 in the United States. Oh, here we go. The days of Lot, the days of Noah, and the days of Elijah. But let me say something to you that the biggest stunning patterns, the biggest patterns that stunned me the most happen to come from the story of the children of Israel when they were living in Egypt and when they eventually departed from the land of Egypt headed back to the promised land because here's what you've got to understand that these narratives that I'm about to show you actually conceal the uh, events that are going to take place or the patterns that will take place in the future among Christians and in the church itself because if you know anything about the Bible, Israel is a type of the church according According to Paul when they were coming out of Egyptian bondage and so we're going to go there right now we're going to look at this and let me share with you some things that I feel like I, I want to get into your spirit the exit of narrative again is an old story that is going to give you parallels of events that's happening right now here's what the story reveals the story of Exodus reveals what I call a divine transition God is moving them out of Egypt that represents the world system into the promised land that not only represents God's promises but it is an imagery of the saints come on somebody moving from the world when we're going to be transported to the promised land of heaven in the rapture of the church the great in fact the only place in the Old Testament where you have a parallel of the rapture is in the wilderness where Moses is on the mountain getting ready to hear from God, right? Children of Israel at the bottom of the mountain and it says that all of a sudden the mountain was in a great smoke and all of a sudden there was fire on the mountain and it said, I love this part, and the sound of a trumpet waxed loud and long. That's the Takiyah Hagodalah in Hebrew. The last trumpet sounded on the festival of trumpets. So this trumpet is sounding and here's the exact wording of the Bible. And the Lord came down and Moses went up. Now, people say the rapture is not in the Bible. There's the imagery of it in Exodus chapter 19. And you can find more details than what I just gave you. So the point that I wish to make is that the story of the Exodus reveals a divine transition. Number two, it reveals the power of the blood of the lamb and the body of the lamb. Oh, this is going to come into play later on. And it also reveals to us what we have to do at the time of the end. As a matter of fact, this narrative that I'm about to preach for the next 60 minutes or so, so next hour is literally amazing and shocking at the same time. And I think that you're going to see it by the time we get to the end of it. And I think this is a good place to give the Lord a praise before we get into this. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the Bible, Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. And the taskmasters are the pictures of demonic powers that are oppressing the people. When you come into Israel and what they represent, as you know, they represent the church. The lamb represents Jesus Christ, his body and his blood. Everything there in the Exodus story has a narrative, if you go to the writings of Paul, that can be found somewhere in the New Testament. Now, here's what I want to tell you. One of the things about the world, the system, Pharaoh, the land of Egypt, is that they were steeped in what was called idolatry. They believed in every God except one. They did not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do I know that? Because when Moses confronted Pharaoh, he said, what God do you serve? Who is your God that I should listen to him? Now, whether you realize this or not, and most of you do if you've lived in this country for three or four generations, there are people from different places coming in, which America is a melting pot. We welcome people from all over the world, but they're bringing their idols with them. 
So that's a picture of what happened in Egypt. In Egypt, it was a land of 10 different gods and God's judgment was against those 10 gods in the 10 plagues that came. And so we see a parallel of the gods of Egypt being allowed, permitted, worshiped, and temples built. And we see the same thing happening in a country that only one time believed there was one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or we would say today, the God of the Bible. When we further begin to re read the scripture about the Exodus story, one, I want to share this with you and I want you to follow me. There are four things that happens in the Exodus story that are very, very, very significant. First of all, we discover that the government or Pharaoh, the world system and Pharaoh, the picture of a wicked world leader, watch this, who knew not Joseph or Joseph's God. What is he asking the midwives to do? Every time that a boy, a male child is born through the Hebrews on the birthing stools, take it and throw it to the Nile River. Now, the reason they wanted to throw those babies in the Nile River is there was a crocodile god that was very well known in Egypt and they, they sacrificed to that crocodile god. So this was actually a sacrifice to their crocodile god in the same way that if you come to the time of the children of Israel, there was an idol god by the name of Moloch, which was a brass god that had a big opening in its belly and it sat on a stool and it looked like a, 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 a calf from the waist up and a man's legs from the waist down. And they would heat the metal up and they would pass a baby. Its hands were like this, that idol was. And they would pass the baby between the hands of Moloch. And it was called in your Bible several times, passing your children through the fire. And what I see about this today is population control through abortion. Because the spirit of Moloch is still in the land, allowing people to offer children as though, it were, as though they did it in the days of Israel under Moloch and they did it in the time of Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, the second thing that you read early in Exodus is it says that Pharaoh began to oppress the people and he hired taskmasters. Oh, this is going to be so funny to share this. He hired taskmasters and the taskmasters literally oversaw the Hebrew people to make sure they were doing their job and make sure they were working. Bill Cloud noted one time that if you take the word taskmasters in modern Hebrew, it means means tax collectors. And I just recently read, I don't know that this will pass or not, but I just recently read that the president that's now in office is going to hire somewhere between 75,000 to 80,000 IRS tax collectors. Folks, listen to me. It's parallel to what I'm telling you right here in the early days of the Exodus before the children of Israel came out of bondage on their way home to the promised land. And that's what I want you to understand. I want you to keep in mind while I'm preaching this that I'm showing you parallels of how things are now, how they were then, the parallel pictures, the imagery is the same because the point is as they came out of the world into the promised land, we're going to be leaving this world and coming into the kingdom of God in heaven at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to, that's really what I want you to keep in mind this whole time. The third thing that they did is they overworked the people. They didn't have <clears throat> enough people working. So they had to overwork the people, give them additional work and put, and then when the people began to complain, they said, you're complaining, we'll show you what we'll do. We'll just add more workload on you. Oh, help me, Jesus. All right. Now, the, they, they were told to make bricks without straw. So that was a regulation that came down from the government of Pharaoh, that we want you to make bricks, but you're going to make them without straw. So government regulations, or we would say the regulations of Pharaoh was impacting the work ethic and the uh, weight and the burden that was upon the people. And America has so many different types of regulations that it actually hinders the business progress and it hinders the success of men and women who want to have small businesses. Now, I'm trying to say to you, and I don't want you to miss this, that history has already showed us certain things that were going to happen. Oh, Lord Jesus. Now, our elected officials, the, the, and I'm not saying all of them because I personally know that there are some good people who love the country that are in the House. There are good people who love the country in the Senate. There are some good people in state legislators. There are good people in government. We understand that not everybody is a little bit on the, on the, yeah, 
yeah, you know, I'm trying to be nice here. Uh, so we, we know that. But let me show you something. And I, this is one of the points that I want to make up front before we go deeper in this. There arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Now, when, the, when Joseph was living, there was a Pharaoh that heard Joseph talk about his God. There was a Pharaoh that knew that the spirit of a God, the true God, was in Joseph to be able to interpret those dreams and save the Egyptians from starvation. And they called him Zephnep Panea. That was Joseph's Egyptian name. And you know what that means? Savior of the world. And that's what Pharaoh gave him that name. But here's what's interesting, and I don't want you to miss this point, that there was a Pharaoh that came that did not know really much about the Hebrew people, that did not know anything about the God of the Hebrew people, that didn't really care to know anything about the God of the Hebrew people. And where we have come from in America, we have dropped so far from how we were founded and the ideas of this nation, even our documents of the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence. We have fallen so far away from that. Why? Because there have been people placed in positions who know not the God of this nation. They do not know the God of our founding fathers. They do not understand nor do they want to believe that the signers of, of all those documents, uh, over 50 men that risked their lives to sign the documents, they, they don't want to believe or comprehend that many of them attended church, almost all of them, that most of them except a few that were deists consider themselves to be Christians. They all believed in God. History is being rewritten because we now have leaders who know not not Joseph. In other words, they do not know the God that helped us get to where we are today. And I want to tell you something, and you better clean your ears out here. When we as a country get to the point that we forget the God who got us here, God will remind us that he was the God that got us here. We shall be reminded by things around us taking place that he was the one who helped us to get the good things that we have. Now look here, for example, Joseph's name in, among the Egyptians was Savior of the world. <laughs> Glory to God. This Pharaoh that knows not Joseph doesn't realize that there is a Savior of the world. Or let me say it this way. Many of our leaders don't even realize that there is a Savior of the world by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They just don't know that. Secondly, Joseph's family, mm, Joseph's family, now Joseph's family came down to Egypt, you know, to live there and lived there for several hundred years. But this Pharaoh did not know the history of the Jewish people, did not know that those people had been brought there by God Almighty. Now, what does that represent to us today? It's the rewriting of American history. Our kids, I hate to say this, are so illiterate when it comes to who, they can't even name five of our former presidents. They can't name anything. They don't even know what the three founding, three branches of government, uh, uh, government is. They can't name, I mean, this is the most pitiful situation I've ever seen in my life that everything is being rewritten because we have a Pharaoh that knows not Joseph. Come on and preach, Perry, I'm going to. They did not realize, this Pharaoh did not realize that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it's recorded in the book of Genesis chapter 15, had predicted that after 400 years or four generations, he was going to bring the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage back to their promised land. He did not know the prophecies of Scripture. He did not know the prophecies of the Hebrew God. He did not know the prophecies and predictions that that God had made for his people. We have a leadership void, vacuum in our country that they don't know the Bible. They do not know Bible prophecy because if you know Bible prophecy, you know one thing. You cannot turn your back on the nation of Israel and expect to be blessed by God or anybody else. You can say, God bless America in every speech you make, but when you begin to turn away from what God says is a covenant country, you're going to end up getting yourself in I wish I could get some help up in this place. What's the problem? They do not know what the prophets teach. They do not know there's a coming war of Gog and Magog. 
They do not know in Matthew 24 that he said pestilence will come in different places and COVID is a pestilence. They don't understand the prophecies of the Bible the way you and I in this congregation understand. And not only this, but Joseph, oh my, 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 my. He believed only in one God and he knew that it was the God of his fathers. But yet the Egyptians were willing to accept anything that was an idol. They were willing to make any animal that existed into an idol. They were willing to worship anything that, that, that nature had produced or God Almighty had allowed, allowed nature to produce. And ladies and gentlemen, what happened is as they're serving their idols, God is going to show up and say, that idol, oh, I'm going to preach this right here. You do understand that the Egyptian magicians, Janez and Jambres, their name is mentioned in the New Testament. You do know that they imitated the miracle of Moses. He threw a snake down, they a rod down, it became a serpent. They threw their rods down. It became a serpent. Pharaoh's not going to be impressed by this. His magicians, when Moses produced a plague, they imitated the plague. Of course, they were really dumb because there's frogs everywhere. They say, we can do that too. And they raise their little hands in the air and they get three times more frogs than they had. Now, the devil is really dumb because here's the thing you need to know. According to your Bible, they could imitate three different miracles and all the a sudden their miracles went dry and here's what they could not do your Bible said they could not undo what the almighty God was doing they couldn't make a frog go away they couldn't make lice go away they couldn't make the sun return when it was dark they couldn't undo the bloody Nile River there was only one God I want to preach his name to you Yahweh God Christ the Lord that had the authority and the power In 35 years of hosting the main event, which is America's yearly camp meeting, this year's gathering was declared by 4,000 attendees to be the best yet. I was inspired to release new prophetic downloads the Lord gave me, including messages exposing satanic plots that are now distracting you. All of the morning speakers shot the arrow of God's revelation right on target to help us through these difficult times. On the opening night, I unlocked the concealed prophetic message in the Jewish New Year 5782 and the coming Gregorian year 2022. I also detailed how the verse numbers in the Torah actually coincide with the exact Jewish year when these predictions occurred. You can see this on our DVD message. This is a stunning Hebraic revelation. There is a new demonic principality dominating American culture and politics that I expose in the message. The third exodus, America is fighting the Ramses spirit. Ancient history is now repeating itself. Discover the strange and future ancient patterns now taking place across America. The message called Programming Americans to Accept the Mark of the Beast will explain how the masses are being set up right now to submit their freedom to the global elitist who will use future pestilences, diseases, natural disasters, and food shortages in an attempt to seize control of economic power. Using details from ancient narratives, I'll walk you through the Bible and my own personal experiences in the message when Satan's ambush becomes your worst day. Satanic strategies work through personalities that create an hour of testing. Follow the playbook of the enemy, unlock his thinking, and discover how to reverse the decision Satan has made against you and your family. My fifth message was a new message called Satan's Greatest Secret Now Exposed. Folks, this is one message your adversary hopes you never hear. This revelation literally transformed my faith, my hope, and gave me strength in a time of great weariness. You have to hear this powerful word. Jensen Franklin preached it's time to write another chapter. Shut the book on your past and write a new future. After hearing this word from God, you will do just that. Tommy Bates came in a morning service and thrilled us with his faith-building message, The Angels Are Coming. The message, which also included incredible faith-building stories, brought thousands to their feet, weeping, rejoicing, and shouting. This message will set you free from fear and anxiety, without a doubt. Listen to the revelation by John Kilpatrick. What if prepare for the end time deception. This astonishing expose is one of the most needed messages for the entire body of Christ in this season. Now you can order all of these eight messages on CD or the DVD. The CDs are the unedited messages and the DVDs are also unedited. 
but the DVDs also include the PowerPoint pictures that you can see that I use. The CDs are $55 and the DVDs are $95 a set. They come in a beautiful album. The offer number for CDs is 21ME-CD. The DVD offer number, as you see on the screen, is 21ME-DVD. I want you to order right now at perrystone.org or call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. I promise you this, this will be one of the best set of messages you have heard in some time. Your purchase goes to keep manifest on the hair. I'm waiting to hear from you. Well, folks, as you know, this is the closing of Manifest. You know, so many people will cut it off after the program or after the little advertisement, and they don't get this part. And this is an important part, so please keep the program on until this done, until you go to the next program. Watch all of it, you know? But uh, two things I want to reiterate, three things. Number one is this offer is very significant because of the revelation and inspiration and the dynamic words of knowledge and wisdom that are locked into every single message that's on these DVDs and CDs. And when you have 4,000 people and they're all just going on and on, oh my goodness, I needed that. Oh, I needed to hear that. Oh, that lifted me up. That encouraged me. Tonight I was healed. God healed my body. And they're talking about that it was the most significant conference in the history of the main event. And that's the people talking. That tells you something. So I want you to get all of the messages. They're available to you right now. And uh, thank you for, because really, this is what helps keep the Manifest telecast on the airs. Those of you who offer, uh, who get the material, and you know, enough of it comes in to help us keep the program on the air. And just so you'll know, Perry Stone does not take royalties off of CDs, DVDs, and all this other stuff that he sells through the ministry. It has gone 100% into the ministry of the gospel. And we have so many things that we have done, like last year, we were giving to all sorts of organizations of feeding kids and feeding uh, presents for kids and food for kids and clothes for kids and water wells. I mean, it just goes on and on. And you've helped make that possible. And I want to thank partners for doing that. Great is your reward in heaven. I believe that. I said something uh, the other day. I want to remind you. This is, you know, we're getting uh, relics in, thousands of relics from, uh, from the, um, uh, and, well, actually, it's, they're working through the Israeli Museum. All of them have numbers on them. This one, the number was on paper and it fell in there and I'm never going to be able to get it out. I don't know how I'm going to get it to get it out anyway. But uh, they're all approved by the Israeli Museum. This is a very, very early vessel. And there's a history behind it. And we get uh, pieces of paper that gives the history for everything that we're getting. We're going to build a major museum of the Bible. Now, this is not just going to have the history of the Bible. And the Bible. This is going to have relics from Joshua's day, a spear from the time of Jesus, from the, a spear, uh, a sword from the Persian uh, Empire, one of the Persian generals. It's got, I mean, this thing's going to be, excuse me while I get the dust off the table. I'm OCD. I got I to gotta make, make everything better. Uh, but if you'd like to be a part of helping us build a great museum for generations to prove the Bible is the Word of God, then you can give a donation to that at Perry Stone Ministries. And uh, we're going to need a lot of help with this. And that's why I'm uh, encouraging you to do that. And if you'd like to keep Manifest on the air, help with any of our projects, we certainly appreciate that. I will tell you this, one thing we've done is always tried to put everything we do, offerings, donations, sales back into the ministry. We've done that our entire life and I'm going to continue to do that. I'm not changing that. So thank you for your prayers and support. And I want you to know how much it's appreciated. We'll see you next week.